Hello and welcome to the second lecture for Unit 1. Um, this lecture we are going to look at two sections of Chapter 1 um, together and we're scrunching it down into one lecture. We're going to be looking at the societies of Africa and the societies of Europe. So let's start with looking at the African kingdoms and this is before the year 1200 AD. The African continent is split into three separate zones. So you have the north, which would be up here, and that is the Saharan Desert. And then in the south, about from here down, you have the savanna, which is a long and flat grassland. Um, in the middle here, you have dense rainforests and rivers and just like we talked about in the American continents you uh, see that people adjust to these different climates and therefore the societies are different and the way that they live is different so these different climates in Africa greatly influenced how societies lived so you have three separate climates two and three and each of them influenced how societies lived. Some African civilizations became, some of them, some African civilizations became complex, like those in America. For example, Ghana ruled Africa between 700 and 1100 AD, and then by 1200 AD, the kingdom of Mali had taken over. The Mali people were ruled by Mansa Musa, and he can be found in your book in section 2 of chapter 1. I would maybe look at him, read a little bit on him. We're not going to get too deep into him right now, though. Most African kingdoms were a little different than the American societies. For example, the Aztec and Inca were large, vast civilizations that controlled millions and millions of people. Most African kingdoms were small territories and each of them had their own ruler, laws, and army. Because of this, each of them having their own armies, African king kingdoms often fought with each other and the, the kings preferred to capture prisoners rather than kill them. They would capture them and then turn their prisoners into their own slaves. This practice continues in by the late 1400s. The rulers of Africa and Central are capturing and selling their enemies into slavery. So the only difference between the slavery practice of the early African kingdoms and the kingdoms in 1400s is that by the 1400s Europeans are showing up and when Europeans show up the African kingdoms don't just turn their enemies into slaves they sell their enemies to the Europeans and that's where the Europeans get their slaves from and eventually they ship them to the Americas and that's where the slave trade starts so we'll be looking at that in later lectures so moving from Africa so we're moving on from Africa north to Europe to this yellow area over here this is where Spain and England France the Netherlands Portugal that's where they're all going to be and we're going to talk about them when they start colonizing the Americas. European or Europe experienced major social, political, and economic changes between 1300 and 1500 AD. Now most of these changes were for the better because in the early 1300s and a little bit before Europe was experiencing very big problems. The Great Famine and the Black Death killed millions of people. And the reason that this is important is because this is what we refer to as the Dark Ages in Europe. And the reason that they're the Dark Ages is because nobody was focused on learning anything new or gaining any more knowledge about anything. Because what they were mostly worried about was, am I going to die? Because if a society has millions of people dying constantly and they don't have enough food 
are they going to be worried about science and math or are they just going to be worried about living another way to think about it is if you have a test and say your test is on Friday and it's Monday and you're going to school and everything's fine but every day you show up 20 more people are gone and they're gone because they've died be from some strange unknown disease that nobody has a cure for are you going to be more likely to worry about your test on Friday and studying for that or are you going to be worried about hope I don't get that disease and I hope I don't die well that's how all of Europe was they were hoping that they didn't die and trying to figure out a way not to die and survive and less about learning about math and science and all this kind of stuff so why did a million people die during the Black Death well this is how it is spread um, it starts up here at the top with these rats. These rats would get bitten bit by these fleas and then it would get the blood of the rat that is carrying this bacteria. The bacteria multiply and there's a whole bunch of them and, and it bites this poor guy. He looks so sad. And then he dies over here in his bed. So, And he dies because the middle ages did not have a, or the dark ages did not have a lot of technology or medicine and you might be wondering why were people just getting bit by fleas all the time why were there rats all over the place well that's because in the dark ages of europe there was not a lot of sanitation people threw their waste out in the streets um, and then if people did die it's not like they had a proper burial for everyone it might be a week before somebody came up and picked up the bodies and it was just not a very clean environment and if it's not a very clean environment chances are people are gonna get really sick and most of them are gonna die but another thing contributed to all of this uncertainty in Europe at the same time the conflict between France and Britain called the hundred years war killed thousand more so thousands more so we have a lot of people dying a lot of chaos terrible things happening but in the 1400s things started turning around people start realizing hey maybe if we don't throw our garbage and our waste out in the streets and let it just sit there maybe we won't get as sick maybe if we don't let dead bodies lie around all the time maybe we won't get as sick and things start looking up for Europe and they start focusing on things outside of just surviving and what happens is we see two cultural movements sweep through Europe after they stop worrying about disease and famine and all this kind of stuff. One is the Renaissance and the other is the Reformation. We'll start with the Renaissance. The Renaissance was a widespread cultural revival of art, architecture, learning, and literature. Basically, people stopped worrying about if they were going to catch a disease and die, and they started thinking, hmm, Maybe we should study some math or study some science, see how the world works. Maybe we should look at what the ancient Greece and ancient Greeks and the ancient Romans did. And hey, they have some pretty good books. Maybe we should read those. Um, I like their architecture. Maybe we should try to build things that look like that. People got smarter. People got more educated, and things started getting better. The Renaissance literally means a rebirth. So before the Renaissance, it's kind of like Europe was dead. It was dying. People were dying all over the place. Nobody was learning new things. They're not growing. They're just kind of dead. But it brought back a focus on math, education, science. And they stopped worrying about themselves and started looking around at the world around them and started to wonder, hmm, I wonder what's across the ocean. Or I wonder if there are any more people out there. And this all leads to an exploration of the world. So, the Renaissance, a direct result of the Renaissance is that people start exploring the world. So, the Renaissance leads directly to exploration. The next movement would be the Reformation. In the 1500s, people began to question the role of the church in society. At this time, the church basically controlled everything. If they didn't like how you were doing something or they didn't like what you believed in, you might get thrown in jail or even killed. People didn't really like this, especially because the church was very corrupt. And corrupt means that they're greedy, they only think for themselves, they're not very fair. 
So people started thinking, you know, we want to reform the church. All right? And reform means to change and improve. And where else do we see reform on this slide? If we draw our attention up here to the title, you can see reform in the word reformation or reformation. So they want to change and improve the church. So people start talking. They're like, you know, we need to do this. We need to do that. We need to change this. We need to change that. And people start arguing. And what happens is they split off into two separate groups. The first group are the Catholics, and they follow the Pope, and they want things to say the same. Today, Catholics follow the Pope, so it shouldn't be hard to remember. Catholics and Pope, it's the same. They wanted to stay the same. The Protestants are the other group, and they wanted to break away from the church in protest. And where do we see protest? Right here in the word Protestant. So, protest, Protestant, Protestants, maybe. They want to break away from the church. So if I asked you what group wanted to break away in protest, you should automatically know that it's the Protestants because it's got the word protest right there in it. During these two events, the printing press helped spread the news of new ideas and new thoughts. So I'd make sure you know a lot about the printing press. Um, it made it easier to share ideas, which made the movements even larger. Today, you probably communicate with your friends through text message or through computer, and that's really quick and it's easy to do. But what happens if um, you don't have that phone or that computer? The form, it's a lot harder to spread the news about what you're doing or ask anybody else what they're doing. So probably what you would have to do if you didn't have a phone or computer is you'd have to write it down and send it to all these people and say, hey, you know, next Saturday, let's all try to get together. And it might take a few days to get there and it would take a long time and you'd have to hand write all these letters and it would take forever. So that's what they had to do before the printing press. Before the printing press... Books and pamphlets and like flyers and handouts would all have to be handwritten. So if you wanted to write down on a piece of paper all these good ideas that you had and you want everybody to know about it, you would have to handwrite it. And if you have to write handwrite a thousand pieces of paper, it's going to take a really long time. So you can't really spread ideas as quickly. But after the printing press, hundreds of books could be published and sold all over the place. So you can spread ideas really quickly. The other important thing to remember is if books all had to be handwritten and say you wanted a copy of the Bible, it would take a very long time for someone just to handwrite a Bible. All right, copy it all down word for word. And if it takes a long time, that person probably can't make a lot of them. And if they can't make a lot of them, they're going to cost a lot more money. So only very rich people can afford to buy books and Bibles and things like that. And if, the, and if you can only get books and Bibles because you're really rich, is the average person really going to bother being able to read? And if you can't read, you can't really become very educated. So with the invention of the printing press, it allowed more people to read. More could read which leads to more education okay and a better lifestyle this is a picture of a printing press right here the printing press allowed information and ideas to spread all over Europe allowing the Renaissance and Reformation to grow basically what you do is this part right here is a huge stamp you would put a piece of paper right here you would turn this lever and this would press down. Get it? Press. It would press down on the piece of paper. You'd leave it there for a little You'd have ink on it. You'd press it down and then you'd pull it up 
and then there would be all the words like you put them in there. All right, and then you'd take another piece of paper and do it to that that next piece of paper, and you you know. But it's a lot quicker. It's not as quick as just printing them off the and the printer that we have here at school, but it's a lot quicker than handwriting every page. So people get all this new information, and all this new information sparked their curiosity about the world, and their curiosity about the world sparked world exploration. So they want to go explore the world. The problem is, even with all the advances in shipbuilding and navigation, open, open travel, ocean travel at this time in the 1400s was controlled by two things, wind and currents. And two currents in particular directed ship travel. And before people knew about these, you would just put your ship out to sea, you would sail out, and you might never be seen again. The first one is the North Atlantic Current. I'm going to show you some pictures, but the North Atlantic Current runs runs clockwise, so it runs this way from Northern Europe to the Caribbean Sea. So you would get in here, you would follow, this is up by England, you would get over here, you would follow the current, it would take you all the way to the Caribbean Sea, where Cuba is, where Florida is, and stuff like that. All right. The South Atlantic Current runs counterclockwise. Between Africa and South America. So you would get in right here and it would take you all the way this way down down this way and then all the way back up to Africa. If we take a quick look at this map, um, it kind of explains a little bit better what we're talking about. So up here at the top, we're looking at the North Atlantic Current because it is in the north. And it is going clockwise. So if 12 o'clock is on a clock right here, 6 o'clock is right here, 3 and nine it is going this way because this is how time goes this is how a clock goes right so if you get in here you're gonna follow this current it's gonna be able to take you all the way to the Caribbean Sea the South Atlantic current is down here so North Atlantic Northern Europe North America North 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 um, the South Atlantic current goes the other direction so if 12 is up here 6 is down here we're going this direction so if you get in right here at Africa you're going to be taken to South America so south it's in the south counterclockwise it connects Africa and South America the northern North Atlantic current connects North America and Northern Europe so let's go back to what we were just talking about and finish up those notes until sailors understood the directions of these currents you would maybe get in and you would just flow for a little while and then you'd just be swept out to sea you wouldn't have enough rations or food and you'd probably die but this they discover all these things and discover the direction of these currents in the 1450s and this opens the door to world exploration so we're only 40 years away from 1492 and what happened in 1492 Columbus sailed the ocean blue and we will talk about that at another time for another lecture but that is what we're looking at for lecture number two um, thanks for listening and we will pick it up in lecture three.